concavity and the second derivative. So here's the plan for the video. We're going to motivate the definition of concave up and concave down. We're going to explore the role of the second derivative in determining concavity. We're going to discuss the independence of monotonicity and concavity. And we should point out that a detailed discussion of inflection points is going to be left for another video. So previously we've talked about monotonicity, which is essentially the uh, property of being either decreasing or increasing. And in this video, we want to figure out a way to sort of measure bendiness, you might say. Um, is, is there some way of analyzing a uh, function to learn about the way it bends? And this property is going to be called concavity. And let's review the terms convex and concave in a non-mathematical setting. So a uh, good thing to do would be to grab a shiny ladle from the kitchen and if you look at the inside part of it, uh, you would be looking at what we would call a concave mirror. And if you flip the ladle around, um, now you're going to be looking at a convex mirror. And there's a famous painting in the National Gallery of London uh, of a portrait. And if you look at the back wall, there's a little detail. If you zoom in on it, you'll notice that we have an example of a convex mirror. And if you actually look inside the mirror, you'll see that there's a little self-portrait of the artist himself um, painting the portrait. A good example of a concave mirror would be a satellite dish, which is able to collect parallel rays, signals coming from far away, and reflect them towards some sort of apparatus that collects these rays and interprets the signal. A great example a huge example is the Arecibo radio telescope in Puerto Rico. So let's talk about convexity in the plane. A set of points in the plane is said to be convex if and only if whenever two points are chosen from the set, all the points on the segment joining those two points are also in the set. So in other words, you pick any two points inside your shape and you join them with a segment and you got to make sure that whole segment lies within the set. And if that's the case, then you are able to declare that the set is convex. So now what would it mean for a set not to be convex? Well, it would just require you to find two points for which the segment joining them contains another point that's not in the original set. And if you can visualize this, then you know that the shape you're dealing with is not convex. So if you look at these five shapes, a moment's thought will tell you that actually they're all convex. And if you, for example, look at these five shapes, you can imagine how none of them are going to be convex if you just choose the right points to exhibit a counterexample of the convexity definition. So now let's get back to the graph of a function. So suppose you have a curve. To motivate our definition, we're going to imagine that the curve divides the plane into two sort of shapes. So we'll imagine that the curve defines a convex mirror pointing down, and it also defines a concave mirror pointing up. And for this reason, we will say that the curve is concave up. And similarly, if you see a curve bending, say, this way, we'll declare that curve to be concave down. Now we need a more official definition of concavity. So here's what we'll do. We'll take a look at the graph of a function defined on an open interval. For the graph to be concave up on the open interval j, we're going to define the region above the graph and what we'll require is we want this region to be convex. And what this means is when you build a secant slope, you would like that secant slope to lie entirely above the graph of f. So let's make this a little more quantified. These endpoints 
of the secant segment correspond to values of the function. And this point in the middle on the secant segment has coordinates x comma y and this point right here lying below is going to also correspond to a function value at x, so that's f of x. So we'll say that f is concave up on the open interval j, if and only if, for all arguments a, x, b, located in that order on the open interval, a is less than x is less than b, f of x is less than y. That's the condition that'll guarantee that the secant segment lies entirely above the graph of f. Now, this isn't very convenient unless we can find some way to write the value of y in terms of the other known quantities a, x, b, and f. So let's do that now. We're going to draw this secant line, and we're going to notice that we already have the coordinates of these two points, a, comma, f of a, and b, comma, f of a. Therefore, the slope of this line is simply f of b minus f of a over b minus a. We can write out the equation of that line in, slope, uh, in point slope form. And now we'll just notice that if we're talking about the argument x, then all we need to do to find the value of y is simply solve this bottom equation for y. And so there is the value of capital Y as a function of the argument x. So let's work on this expression and um, render it a little more intuitive. So we're going to multiply f of a by b minus a over b minus a. We're going to factor out the b minus a in the denominator. We're going to get this expression and notice that x minus a can be factored across this subtraction. And now what we're going to do is we're going to factor this f of a out. And now we have some cancellation. The a's cancel and we get this term right here. And now we're going to distribute the 1 over b minus a back into the expression and we get this. There's a nice expression for capital Y in terms of A, X, and B, and the function F. And I'll just mention in passing that if you look at that carefully, that is a weighted average of the values F of B and F of A. If you take those two coefficients in front of those values and add them together, you'll get one. So if we're willing to do a good bit of simple algebra, we can rewrite this as a much more intuitive condition. So here we go. We're going to multiply both sides by b minus a. We're going to clear out the fractions. Now we're going to just make a little space here, and we're going to subtract x and add x. And by doing this, we can now factor, or I should say distribute, f of x across the sum to get this term, this uh, inequality right here. And now we're going to subtract these from both sides. Believe it or not, we're making progress. There's a b minus x and an x minus a, which can be factored from both sides. And now we can just divide through by b minus x, x minus a, and we get this expression. So the original inequality can be rewritten in an equivalent inequality that looks like this. So we'll say that f is concave up on the open interval j if and only if for all arguments a less than x less than b inside the open interval j, you get this inequality. And this inequality has a lot of meaning because this expression right here, you'll notice, is just the secant slope for this interval uh, a to x. Similarly, this expression is the secant slope from the inter for the interval x to b. So for example, the left-hand secant slope might be, say, negative 1.11, and the right-hand secant slope might be, say, negative 0.28, and it is clear that uh, the left-hand secant slope is actually less than the right-hand secant slope. So we can rephrase our condition as saying adjacent secant slopes are increasing. As you look at adjacent secant slopes from left to right, the secant slopes have to be increasing. And this has to be true for all a, x, and b. So no matter which triplet of points you select in your open interval, it should be the case that as you calculate the secant slope on the left and the right, the one on the left is smaller. Now how does the second derivative get invited to this party? So here's a theorem. Suppose f is twice differentiable on the open interval j and f double prime of x is greater than zero for all x in j then f is concave up on j. 
To say that a function is twice differentiable is precisely what it sounds like. It just means you can take the derivative twice. So the domain of f double prime is the open interval j. So here's a proof of our theorem. So let a, x, and b be any three arguments for which a is less than x is less than b. We're going to make no other assumption about these three arguments except that they are in the open interval j and a is less than x is less than b. So we've got our open interval j and we have our three arguments which could be anywhere inside of j but a is less than x is less than b. And our goal is to show that the left-hand secant slope is smaller than the right-hand secant slope. If we can prove this, making no other assumptions about ax and b, then we've proved the theorem. So first we note that f is differentiable on the open interval from a to x and continuous on the closed interval from a to x. This is simply because f is differentiable on the open interval j itself. And similarly, f is differentiable on the open interval from x to b and continuous on the closed interval from x to b. What this means is that we can apply the mean value theorem. We know there's an argument, we'll call it zl for z left, for which the tangent slope, f prime of zl, is actually equal to the secant slope on the interval from a to x. And similarly, there's a zr between x and b, for which f prime of zr is equal to the secant slope on the interval from x to b. zr, the mnemonics here, is the right-hand z. So zl and zr, and so what does this mean? Well, f double prime is positive. That's the hypothesis of the theorem. And that means f prime is a strictly increasing function on j because its derivative, i.e. f double prime, is always positive. Since f prime is strictly increasing and zl is less than zr, it means that f prime of zl is less than f prime of zr. But f prime of zl is the one secant slope and f prime of zr is the other secant slope and so this just means we have proved exactly what we needed to prove. The left hand secant slope is smaller than the right hand secant slope. So let's look at an example. If f of x is x squared, well then f prime of x is 2x and f double prime of x is the constant function 2. So we have f double prime of x is positive on the whole real axis, and therefore the original function f must be concave up on all of r, which of course is something we already sort of intuited from the graph of x squared being a parabola opening up. It is indeed concave up on the whole real axis. Suppose f of x is the exponential function e to the x. Well, f prime and f double prime are both e to the x, and e to the x is always positive, and therefore the original function must be concave up on the whole open interval going from negative infinity to infinity. Let's state the theorem in its full generality because of course we haven't talked about concave down. So if f is twice differentiable in the open interval j and f double prime is positive on j then f is concave up and in the other direction, if f double prime of x is negative for all x and j, then f is concave down. Now, how do we use this theorem to analyze concavity? Well, the answer is we analyze the sine of f double prime. So schematically, suppose you had a function f, and then you calculate its second derivative, whatever it looks like, and you're able to look at that graph, and you're able to say, well, here is where the second derivative is 0, and here it are the locations where f double prime is positive, and here's where f double prime is negative, then those open intervals are the ones that we want to look at, and then we know that the original function must be concave up on these two intervals, and it must be concave down on this interval. So a sine analysis of the second derivative of a function enables you to conclude what the concavity is on the, uh, for the original function. So let's look at an example concretely. Suppose f of x is the cosine function, then you know that the first derivative is negative sine and the second derivative is negative cosine. So let's concentrate on the graph of the second derivative, negative cosine. It's zero at pi over two and then we can add on integer multiples of pi, but we wanna examine these intervals are the intervals on which the second derivative is positive, and these intervals are the intervals on which the second derivative has a negative value. And if you look at the original graph, you'll notice that these are the intervals 
on which the graph is either concave up or concave down, depending on whether the second derivative is positive or negative. Now these points at which the concavity changes, those are going to be known as points of inflection. So we say that the point a comma f of a is an inflection point of the graph of f if the concavity of f changes across the argument x equals a. In this example, we see the graph's concave down and then it switches to concave up, so we'd say this is an inflection point. But we need to add a note. You may wish to add a technical requirement. Why is that? Just saying the concavity changes might not be what you had in mind. So here's a graph where the, uh, on the left of A, the graph is concave down, and on the right of A, the graph is concave up. But there's a discontinuity at A, and so perhaps you want to include continuity in your definition. And here's an example where the concavity is downwards to the left of A, and it's upwards to the right of A. Now the graph is continuous at A, but it's not differentiable at A, and maybe you want differentiability. So it's perhaps not just enough to say that the concavity changes depending on what you want your definition of an inflection point to entail. Now one final thought. Monotonicity and concavity are independent notions. What do we mean by this? Well, let's suppose you had a graph where the tangent slopes were positive and they were increasing. Now how would those tangent slopes gather themselves together in a graph? You might see a graph that looks like this. Now this is an increasing graph that is concave up. You could also have negative tangent slopes which are increasing. So look at these values of the tangent slope and they're increasing. What kind of graph behaves this way? Well now we have a decreasing graph which is concave up. Of course, you can play this game in the other direction. So imagine that we had a bunch of negative slopes that are actually decreasing. What kind of graph would look like this? Well, it would be a decreasing graph that is concave down. And finally, you can imagine having a bunch of positive tangent slopes that are decreasing. And what kind of graph would we have in this case? We'd have a graph that is both increasing and concave down. So the point of these observations is that monotonicity manifests itself as either an increasing or decreasing graph and concavity manifests itself as either concave up or concave down. All four of these combinations are actually possible. So you should never fool yourself into imagining that just because a graph is concave up, it is necessarily increasing, say. Um, you have to remember that concavity and monotonicity are actually independent of each other. All four combinations are possible.